everyone. Thank you for the warm welcome. It's so exciting to be here. Hey, some of my team are here, and I told you to go to the Harlem Globetrotters <laughs> one. You've seen this work. You hear me talk all the time. What are you doing? Uh, it's funny, I was actually looking at the website because I, I want to see as many talks as possible and I saw that I was scheduled at the same time as the Harlem Globetrotters and my first thought was, oh, I really wanted to see that one. And my next thought was, well, at least I'll have an empty room, so I'm not, there's nothing to be nervous about. But you showed up, you came, thank you very much, I really appreciate it. It's inspiring to be here in this beautiful place. It's inspiring to be in a room full of like-minded marketers, brand builders, intelligent, passionate people. Um, and I had to figure out what story I wanted to tell today when I had this opportunity, and, and we do a lot as a brand and a lot as marketers. We're passionate about social impact, we do brand campaigns, we market the premium offering, you know, we uh, do a lot of work with artists. But I decided that I wanted to tell a story about data storytelling. And that's not because we're the only brand that does it, a lot of brands get creative with data. But I think we're a little bit unique in that the way um, we've worked with data has really helped define our brand and helped us find our voice. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. But first, I was told I have to talk about myself, which is something I'm far less comfortable about. So I'm going to tell you a story about stumbling. And I'm going to talk about stumbling a lot because I believe about in stumbling into success. And by stumbling into success, I don't mean having no plan or being clumsy or being reckless or... I know I'm Australian, so you maybe think I'm, that means constantly being drunk. Fair assumption, but no. Um, it means not always being sure of your footing. It means being willing to take risks, to try different things, to maybe think this will be the successful thing, but then realize actually that was, and really doubling down and iterating on that. It's to realize that no one really just goes from A to B, and that you can look at someone's career or someone, a brand from the outside and feel like it was all just this master plan that was all plotted out. I mean, not in my experience. I'm amazed by anyone that has a five-year plan and knows where they want to be in five years. Our world is changing so much. So many new opportunities are coming up. I don't know where I want to be in three years. I'll probably find out in two years' time, and it'll be an amazing and expiring uh, thing, and I'll stumble into it. And I very much believe in that. I stumbled into the industry. I didn't even know copywriting was a thing. It's just that I went to art school. I was unemployable. I had a kind friend who said, you seem to be good with words, and there's an agency that needs like a junior who'll work for nothing. I said, well, <laughs> you found him. And so <laughs> I went and met with a very kind creative director who gave me a brief, gave me a shot, gave me a job. Um, and I stumbled into uh, the digital department of Ogilvy in Sydney. Keep in mind, and I'm going to age myself now, at that time, that, that was the bottom of the heap. We were like 20 people in a kind of a basement. The people who did direct mail looked down on us. They felt sorry for us. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I was pumping out emails, like banners were like my Super Bowl campaign, you know, I was like, th this was what I was doing, and I very easily could have felt like, oh, when do I start making TV commercials, when, when do I do that, but when you stumble into something, I realized I'd stumbled into the future, I was in the perfect place, I was the only writer, I was getting to work on every brand. By the time I left, and it wasn't because of me, that team was triple the size, and, and a focus for the company in terms of its growth, I learned so much. Um, I stumbled out of that because of my sense of um, adventure. I saw a job advertised in Cambodia. Uh, the only multinational agency there needed a senior writer. Uh, English, but they had to be willing to sort of learn the culture and, and everything else. I couldn't believe it. I hustled ho so hard for that job. I took a terrible salary, said I'd be there in four weeks. I like hounded them. I got there, I was like, thank you so much for picking me. And they were like, you were literally the only applicant. Like no one else was interested. <laughs> 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 But I had to unlearn everything. The internet was so slow there, there was no online advertising. I was doing billboards. I couldn't use my copywriting skills because, you know, a clever English headline wouldn't go anywhere. I had to learn from my colleagues. I had to collaborate. It was the hardest job I'll ever have. It was also one of the most fun, and I probably learned more there than anywhere I've ever been before. Something also happened there while I was there. This little website called Facebook came out, and social media seemed to be a thing. I realized I couldn't stay too long, and I had to get back, and I had to sort of learn what was happening in the world, what was happening with this social media thing and, and my first passion. Got a great job in Sydney, uh, managed to convince them, this, this little digital agency, I should be their first ever copywriter. But a few months in, like, th they didn't have 40 hours of billable work for me. I kept waiting for the tap in the shoulder. And the tap in the shoulder I got was different to what I was expecting. The tap was, actually, Unilever, you know, we're doing different stuff. They've got these brand pages on Facebook, and since you're good with words, could you manage these seven brand pages on Facebook? And they looked a bit nervous as they told me, and I was like, I can't believe this. This is so exciting. Of course, I'd love to. And they were like, really? And I'm like, yes. I, I learned so much there, not because of like 
social media or brand pages or anything else. I was working directly with the consumers, with the people who love these brands. I was seeing their comments. I was posting stuff and seeing how they reacted. It was so inspiring, and that taught me so much. New York came calling. I landed at a great place called Razorfish. I got to work on more Unilever brands. I got to work on Mercedes-Benz um, and learn a lot there. And then about a year and a half, um, no, about three years into my tenure, or three and a half years, um, I was asked to pitch for some Spotify business. And I started working on the Spotify brand from the agency side. And after about a year and a half in, um, a very inspiring VP who was uh, running the department at that time, Jackie Jantos, sort of pulled me inside and said, we need a creative director in-house. We want to build out an in-house team. We want to be a creative force. Would you be interested? My brain exploded. And again, it was no sure thing. Uh, when creatives go into brands, it, it often doesn't work. And a lot of people weren't interested at working in-house. But I jumped in foot first, my, my, my feet first. My instinct was this, this just could be incredible. I also thought it could be my biggest face plant ever. I just didn't care because it was going to be such a like, fascinating one. I was going to learn so much and I, I just didn't want to die wondering. So that's my journey um, and it always is a journey. And today I'm going to talk about some of the work we've done over the years, specifically around data. Um, we're really happy with where we are in our journey. This was a, a top 10 brands in the US study and survey that came out last year. Look at that incredible company we're in, and relevance is something that we're all about. Um, but again, there's been no master plan to get there, and we're certainly not, by any sense, feeling cocky or sure that we can, we can stay there. We're working very hard on that. But what has the journey looked like? I'm going to start it back in 2014. I was actually on, on the agency side at that time working with Spotify, and they said, look, we have all this user data. We thought it could be cool to do some kind of app or website where people could relive the, the year of listening they'd had. And we're like, that sounds amazing. And so we built out this sort of online tool where you could find out your top genres, your top artists, what, what you listen to every season, how many minutes you listened. And we had a good feeling that people would care, that this would be exciting. And sure enough, back then, that, these were big numbers. Over 5 million people used it. What we didn't realize is how much they would share. Um, we built in these shareable snapshots of your music listening that you could put out on Twitter or on Facebook. And over a million people decided to share them. And they had a very personal reaction to their data. It was sort of like, oh my god, don't judge me. This is really embarrassing. Or look how incredible my taste is. Or don't blame me for that one artist. I, I had a really bad boyfriend at that time. And he was always using my Spotify and playing it. It was a very person, personal sort of connection that people had. It also tipped us off on something. Spotify's growth had all been about word of mouth. It was all people going, this Spotify app's are uh, you know, really, really cool. I'm sure a lot of people in this room know that challenge. It's amazing if word of mouth is growing your business, but you can't rely on it alone. And how do you scale that? Suddenly, we thought we had something. How do we allow people to share their data and scale that word of mouth to a much broader audience? So a few months later, we launched another digital experience called Taste Rewind. I like to think of it as a time machine. And what it essentially did is it looked at your taste and the music you listen to today, and then it took you on a journey to show what you would be listening to if you were living in another decade. And each of these were created as like personalized movie posters and almost festival of you that you could, um, sorry, music posters, a festival of you that you could share out. And each one came with a playlist, therefore bringing more use on the platform. Fast forward two months later, and we brought out Found Them First based on a very simple insight. We all know that person who's like, oh, I was into that band before anybody else. <laughs> yeah. Oh, them, oh yeah, I mean, now they're totally played out. Like, everyone knows about them, but you know, I was into their early stuff. Um, we realized that we were the first company with our data that could actually prove it and give you true bragging rights. I called it the Hipster Olympics, because that's exactly what it was. <laughs> So people could connect, they would go in, and we really made it a hard, hard threshold. And they would find out how many artists, so they had like the number, the bragging thing that they could put out. And then they, they would then be introduced to each artist, they'd be told if they're in the top percentile. And then they could even connect with that artist on Twitter and tell them, I was into you before everyone else. And then the artists started to demand that we would upload videos thanking their fans. Suddenly data was making really meaningful connections that couldn't exist before. End of that year, it was a no-brainer. We did another digital end-of-year experience. But then a funny thing happened, and this was a stumble into success kind of moment. Somebody from the marketing team came up and said, oh, we're so excited about this year's campaign and the momentum. We've booked 10 billboards in New York in different neighborhoods. And I was like, that's amazing. And then they walked away, and then I thought, what are we going to do with them? I have no idea. You don't just do billboards advertising a website. 
So we had to think, and we thought, what if we dug into our data and in each billboard we told the neighborhood something unique about how they listened, what was unique about the listening in that data. So we went you know, to Gowanus, which was once a very gritty, somewhat dangerous neighborhood that now has a Whole Foods and a bunch of you know, strollers everywhere. And sure enough, deep sea playlists were trending highest in that area, so we revealed it. But the real breakthrough moment for our brand and for our marketing happened in Williamsburg. We had a big, beautiful piece of real estate on the, uh, to fill in in Williamsburg. And we dug into the data there, uh, wondering to see what the top trending song would be for that neighborhood. And this is what we found. Sorry, not sorry, Williamsburg. Bieber's hit trended highest in this zip code. It was a news story. Bieber posted it himself. People were going there to take photos. I saw it in my friend's feeds. Suddenly, we realized there was some really interesting cultural stories and tensions we could be tapping into. And had we used that real estate to say that we had over 40 million songs or that you could get three months for 99 cents, there might have been some marketing impact but we wouldn't have had nearly the same impact and the same earned media. Which sort of taught us another lesson, that talking about yourself is boring. When we're a brand like Spotify at the intersection of all these incredible creators, of all this incredible technology, culturally relevant, why would we be talking about ourselves? Instead, we decided to bring our own point of view, our own tone, and talk about the world around us, to talk about creators, to celebrate culture. Um, and we decided to experiment with our first ever film brand campaign and see if we could base films around user behavior, celebrating the people who are actually making our platform uh, by the way they listened. I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. I can't believe after all these years, people are still listening to this song. Me neither. So that, that piece of creative just came from a creative going to a house party, hearing the song, going, wow, do people still listen to that? And we just dug into the data, and sure enough, they did. And that's the story we decided to tell. We also, at the same time, uh, noticed a couple of things. People were creating a lot of moving playlists. You know, when they're moving a house, they want a special playlist for it. And then we noticed at the same time that there was an election coming up at the end of 2016, and uh, people were talking about moving for a different reason. So we created this spot. Open up the champagne, pop. It's my house, come on, turn it up. Uh. Hear a knock on the door and the night begins. Cause we've done this before, so you come on in. We're allowed to stay, right? We don't have to go back after this conference. I just wanted to check. Um, so we sort of set up this laboratory, this idea of mad meets math, and we decided to really embrace um, the data that we had but then use that to be as creative as we could possibly try to be. And I talked about stumbling into success and iterating when, you, when you're lucky enough to do that. So we went from 10 billboards at the end of 2016 in one city to 7,000 billboards around um, the world the following year. And I'll show you some samples of that creativity. Remember this was 2016. It had been a very divisive year. People were in quite a funny place. So we decided to try to use our data to prove that there's one thing that unites us all, that we're all weird, and that's what we sort of iterated on. Dear person who played sorry 42 times on Valentine's Day, what did you do? <laughs> Dear 3,700 people who streamed it's the end of the world as we know it on the day of the Brexit vote, hang in there. <laughs> also in the UK, um, a really popular nightclub, uh, like iconic nightclub called Fabric Closed. To the 21,000 people who played dancing on my own the day Fabric Closed, you weren't. To the person in the leader who started listening to holiday music way back in June, you really jingle all the way, huh? <laughs> Dear person who made a playlist called One Night Stand with Jeb Bush like he's a Bond girl in a European casino, <laughs> we have so many questions. <laughs> so we decided not just to celebrate the year for all that it was, but also to try to reward listeners who'd made it special by listening so much. And we embraced our inner dad joke, our love of puns, 
and decided to get truly weird and send special gifts. So to the top listeners uh, in, in, all over the world of Sia, we sent Sianta hats, which were blessed by her and had you know, inbuilt wigs. Trap music had a huge year, so we made trapping paper instead of wrapping paper. <laughs> and Fetty Wap made a film to promote it. And we love our heavy metal film uh, fans, so we created cornaments. Um, I still have some, and my kids help me put them on the tree every year. We realized that data was helping us to connect with culture. And at the end of 2017, we had to think, OK, what are we going to do? We had the gallows humor in 2016. And we thought, actually, maybe people want to be a bit more optimistic. Maybe they want to look forward instead of looking back this year. So we thought, how could our data and how could the interesting things that artists and users had done help people make goals for the year to come. One example here. Be as loving as the person who put 48 Ed Sheeran songs on their I Love Gingers playlist. <laughs> and of course, we got permission from the, the uh, young woman who, who made this uh, playlist to, to feature it. And as we were messaging with her, she was like, wait a minute, is Ed Sheeran going to see this? And we're like, no, he has to approve it. And she was like, this is the best day of my life. <laughs> 2018 goals take a page from the 3,400 people who stream the Boozy Brunch playlist on a Wednesday this year. <laughs> it's not lost on me today is Wednesday, so I hope some of you are feeling seen. <laughs> Hit the dance floor with the person who made a playlist called Daddy Pence Come Dance. <laughs> and definitely avoid the medical professionals who added these songs to operating room playlist. Stressed out, can't feel my face, stairway to heaven, and say you won't let go. <laughs> We worked with hundreds of artists, we worked with data technicians to celebrate the year in culture and to hopefully give people an inspiring moment of levity at the end of the year. Um, one example I liked was for a podcast in Canada, Be Proud of Canada Land. Luckily, our US neighbors make it easy. Most streamed Canadian news podcast. Of course, we did the personalized data experience, but it had become so impactful and it was getting tens of millions of visitors that in a year of fake news, people started making fake share cards, which we thought was hilarious, and putting out using Photoshop to do that. So we lent into it, and we thought, OK, well, there's a partner we could work with that's getting really good at fact-checking. You know, they, they like to fact-check the political debates. They like to fact-check political speeches. What if we used our data to find the top songs of the year, and then we fact-check some of the biggest hits of the year with them? Uh, so, for example, Ed Sheeran had made the claim, the club isn't the best place to find a lover, so the bar is where I go. Not quite, found the New York Times. If Mr. Sheeran truly wants to find a lover, he might want to look elsewhere. A 2014 survey found that only about 20% of couples meet in bars, while around 30% meet during their daily lives. <laughs> Sex by the fire at night, silk sheets and diamonds or white, was what Bruno Mars said. A thumbs up from New York Times, if you're going to make love by a fire, sheets made from pure silk fabrics, not a polyester-based satin silk, are a safe bet. So I think we're all smarter for knowing that. We felt by this stage that we'd built a franchise, and so it's our role once you've done that to keep experimenting, keep trying new things. Some will be huge and take off, some will just be interesting and you'll learn from them. Come 2018, we tried all sorts of things. We knew that the most passionate users were desperate for their data, and all through November they were tweeting about wanting to get their data. So we created um, puzzles for some of the biggest, lis um, biggest listeners of some artists. And a week or two before everyone else, if they assembled the jigsaw puzzle, they could find out their top artists before anyone else and, of course, share that on social. We also realized how much people loved sharing their share cards at the end of the digital experience. So we said, you know what? Oversharing is underrated. We actually allowed them not just to share on Facebook and Twitter, but to opt in to share their data on some of the biggest billboards in some of the most iconic locations in the world, and tens of thousands of people chose to do so. And for the first time, our website gave a data experience to artists as well, so that they could see their top countries, their top fans, what kind of playlists they were getting added to. And naturally, they could share that, which more than doubled our social impressions based on that campaign, because of course, they have so many followers. And it was really inspiring to see the conversations on social and as artists and fans thanked each other. So we came to 2019, and now that we'd established this, we had the realization that we were the only global streaming platform, because we were the original, that's been around for the whole 10 years, and that we had data to prove it. We had a whole decade that we could celebrate. And I'm going to share you um, just a short case study of what we did in December of last year um, to really dance to 10 years of data. It was an unforgettable decade that we all remembered differently. Hold up. Spotify presents a decade wrapped. 
We started with a broadcast film showcasing one listener's epic journey to create the ultimate playlist. Ooh, Teenage Dream. Cool. Sick and Load was the best song of the decade. Despacito. And a teaser congratulating the world's biggest pop star for making history. When we all fall asleep, where do we go? It's Spotify's most streamed album of the year. Wow. <laughs> We wrap the world in data stories to reflect a wild 10 years. And the campaign inspired an original podcast that used Spotify data. Over 309,000 fan-made playlists. While an online experience allowed artists and fans to relive their own data. And if you don't use Spotify, I feel bad for you. But I listened to her for 230 hours. The campaign took on a life of its own as people shared the story of their decade. Some even started planning for the next one. So it's a journey, as I said, and we've had a lot of fun doing it. Um, we certainly haven't started planning for the next one because no one's allowed to talk to me about this till May. <laughs> it's a strict rule. It's a lot of work. Um, but what I would say is it's not even limited to our own data. And, and what I did want to talk about is it's not just how we've used our data, but how data helped us to find our voice. Um, sometimes it's just about finding maybe a data-based insight. So I'm going to finish with a campaign that we launched recently. And it was a very simple brief from the marketing team. Uh, they essentially said, we want a really on-brand way to reach out to current Spotify users who are not using Spotify in the car. Because they should be. It's a great experience, and that's a great use case for listening to music and to podcasts. And so what the team did, because we're now used to this, we're used to digging in, we try to find the data, we try to find the interesting facts, is they looked through pages of insights, stats about how people drive, and one jumped out at them straight away. It was the fact that over 70% 70 70 of people reported that they had stayed in a car um, in order to hear a, a song play out in order to hear the end of it. So um, that's all we needed to know um, to create a campaign like this. Thank you very much. The, building a brand and, and marketing, it's, it's a huge amount of risk. It's a huge amount of intuition. Um, it's very easy to try to stay on safe footing, and we see it in our industry all the time. Um, I think that we're here because we all share the same mentality, that that's not the best way. Um, and I'm so happy to be with like-minded people. If I was to leave you with one thought coming out of today, is let's not take the safe route. Let's not stay on safe footing. Let's learn from each other's mistakes. Let's celebrate each other's successes. 
and let's stumble together. Um, thank you very much. That was awesome. Well, congrats on the award. Oh, thank you very um, much. We're looking forward to honoring you at the gala tomorrow night. Our previous guest, uh, Jane from Skittles, I think she's over there. I love also Skittles. I love from your Australia. work. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, you, so you made the transition from Australia to, to Brooklyn, I understand? Yes, that's right. Yeah. How, how have you been finding that, that uh, transition? Gosh, I don't, I will, if it's about a life thing, I think I, when my wife and I decided to move to New York, it was sort of a like, well, if you don't get a job in New York, I mean, we, we wanted to have kids, so let's settle down and have a family here. So we moved to New York and, you know, within a couple of uh, years, we had one kid, we were pregnant with another, we were thinking about buying it. We grew up real quick, <laughs> so and life changed very, very, very fast at that time. So I don't know if I can even think about, you know, the location in itself, because there's just been so many other life changes. What I will say to anyone here is if you're thinking um, about moving to Brooklyn, um, um, I would say do it tomorrow. It's a great place to live. I love it. Right on. Um, I really love the way that Spotify has uh, flipped the script on, you know, to focus on celebrating your listeners and their habits and their behaviors rather than, you know, promoting the artists, the music, the content, the merchandise, really. And um, how you, you, you shared some examples of how they've been sharing their data. How else have customers been responding to, to that sort of a, a approach? Because it's so different. Um, well, I, I would say that we definitely do still promote artists and everything. Today, I, I chose a particular type of work to share. You know, it is very important to us to be great partners to creators, and I would stress that that's hugely motivating to us as well, and, and paying tribute to them is important. I think what works really well is when we can find a magic way with data to like bring fans and artists together. Um, so one example is our fans first um, sort of live concert experience where we'll work with an artist, could be anyone from a Jonas Brothers to a St. Vincent, you know, an incredible hip hop artist. And we'll kind of try to pick their brains and find out like what's the wildest dream kind of live experience that they would like to put on. And we sort of host that event for them. We collaborate with them on the creative for that. And then we use the data to find the 100, maybe 500, however many we can fit in their biggest fans uh, who deserve that. You know, it's not a ticket they buy. They get it really through their passion for the artist. And it's led to wild experiences where an artist like Troy Sivan just really wanted to sing and talk and play music to his top, top fans in a bubble in the mid middle of the desert. And that's exactly what we made happen. Um, but it was, it was data that helped us to facilitate that. How do you approach partnerships and things like that? Like, are there, you know, what, what would make a good partnership and what might you, you know, steer away from? Do you mean a, a brand partnership? Yeah. Or, a, um, you know, or even within, with an artist? Or? Yeah, well, I mean, when it comes to artists, we're, we're really try to be there for, for as many as we can um, because, you know, we, we want to be supporting the entire industry and, and lifting everybody up. When we do a brand-driven artist collaboration, um, I can't say that we have a particular formula, um, but recently two pieces of creative that I think have been um, quite impactful, one was a tribute to Prince and, and one was a tribute to Bowie, both happened to take place in the New York subway, um, but both of them just seem to have the attributes of artists um, that seem really aligned to our brand values, they seem to have had a huge impact, um, and they seemed worthy of celebration. Another um, way that we decided to partner recently was to create what we call the Rap Caviar Pantheon, uh, where we literally create um, almost Greco-Roman style statues of um, up and coming rappers and put them in museums um, where you would not normally see um, artists like that reflected. Um, so I, I can't say that there's a, a general logic that we follow, but there's a certain instinct where we get a sense what's appropriate for our brand. Can you tell us about the creative process behind that? I mean, you are the creative director, but uh, I mean, you, you gave us that one example where they dumped the media by on your desk and said, you know, have fun with that. But <laughs> with, what's the, proce the process that you go through to come up with ideas or, or you know, executions like some of the ones that you shared with us? Um, it differs. Um, we're a little bit unusual in that the majority of our creative is developed um, in-house. Um, we certainly have great agency partners around the world who localize creative and who take toolkits and, and do local campaigns. And certainly from time to time, we get value from um, partners, particularly when, when work capacity is tough. But we have a good you know, um, 50 makers alone, whether they be integrated producers, copywriters, um, art directors. And them being within the four wall walls of the company just gives them direct access to opportunities. And very often, it's opportunistic. It's about having creative thinkers 
um, and the ability to go, oh wow, we're um, sponsoring this David Bowie exhibition and somebody over the company decided to do this. Um, that seems like a great opportunity to do something hyper-creative. I'm gonna chat to the media people over here and it turns out actually they can book his local train station in Soho where he used to live nearby. And very often it's having, um, I think, the creative ambition linked with the ability to connect the dots. Um, the Prince campaign was a very similar example. We had booked media in Union Square, the most expensive station takeover you can book, and then the brand campaign we were meant to deliver through some issues out of our control, but, but we didn't have creative to put in there, we screwed up. And so I was talking to the marketing manager and she's like, okay, well, I've got a whole station and nothing to put in there and it wasn't cheap. And then I got a phone call later that day saying Prince is coming back to the Spotify platform, but we're not allowed to talk about it till Grammys night. And I said, yeah, but can anyone stop us just from putting empty purple posters all over Union Square? And they said, let me call and find out. And they said, no. And so that's what we did for three weeks. We just had empty purple posters with our logo on it. And then the day of the Grammys, Prince appeared on every single one of them. But again, I'm not saying somebody sat down and had this brilliant lightning bolt moment. That's about collaboration. It's about having the right culture. And it's about being able to work differently um, to solve these problems. You uh, mentioned you have a team of what, 50 people in-house? Um, yeah, we're part of a larger department that's the brand and creative team, which is probably closer to, to 80, but I have 50 what I would call like hands-on makers, yeah. Right, and what, what talent do they represent versus the, you know, the kind of expertise that you would need to go outside your four walls? Um, uh, most of them have come from agency backgrounds. Um, I think when I'm hiring, I'm, uh, some of them are, are here. Please don't steal them. Um, I think when, I, um, when I'm hiring, I... Um, or do, if you do, take them to good places. <laughs> They're all brilliant. When, I, um, when I'm hiring, obviously the book is important, the background, uh, most of them have come from environments, whether it's a, you know, a shiny agency like a, a, a Droger or Wyden, or whether it's a, a really interesting um, sort of brand or, or, or more niche agency. Um, but there's also something that's really important about attitude and personality. Um, and that's not just the, you know, no assholes thing or anything like that, but it's actually the, the sort of, combination of tenacity, the combination of, of willing to take risks, um, the combination of working in slightly different environments and, and being a genuinely collaborative person, not just someone who can perform collaboration. Um, all of those are really important to succeed, I think, in an environment like ours. You shared with us how data feeds uh, your brand creative, but how does it feed other aspects of the brand? Oh, in, in, in everything. Data is so core to what we do. I mean, uh, I don't, I'm hoping there's a lot of Spotify um, sort of users in the room, but uh, a lot of them will say, how come my Discover Weekly knows me so well? Or how come these playlists are just so intuitively? And how come they always know the new song to service up? Like, data is really core to our platform. Um, it, it's core to a lot of our even decision-making process in terms of where we place our bets and what we do. Um, yeah, I, I, I would say that we are just like, you know, one small example of how, how core and key data has been to Spotify's success. We, we see these innovative communications and all the, the technological innovation that we as, as Spotify subscribers get to experience. What's the culture like, what's the brand culture like at Spotify that, that is able to produce such amazing work? It's funny, we only just, and our team was part of it, we only just uh, created what we called it our band manifesto, which so, sort of talks about our culture. Um, and so I sort of feel freely to sort of borrow some language from that. There's some tenets that we believe in. You know, we don't have time for internal politics. We trust each other. We believe in being playful. Um, you know, we do believe there's a unique culture that, that came out of Sweden and then scaled globally that's, that's worth protecting and, and has led to, to good things. Um, we often like to talk about it as, and it feels weird, but controlled chaos. Um, because you know we're, we, we never want to be too bureaucratic, we never want to be overly structured, we never want to be 20 people in a room when three people, when properly empowered, could probably get to a better result quicker. Mm -hmm. um, so those are all core parts of our values and, and naturally as any company grows, you need to have them sort of there in stone so you can keep measuring yourself against those values. And many of the brands that, uh, that have enlightened us here over the years and, and even as we're here over these few days talk about the importance of a brand's higher purpose and I'm wondering does Spotify have, have a noble brand cause or a credo that drives all the brand decision making? Absolutely, I mean we envisage a world and, and we're proud to, to be hopefully building a world where over a million creators can be living off their art, over a billion people can be inspired and, and, and live by it. You know our mission is to essentially inspire people and it's to inspire people to listen and connect with the world around them. 
And I don't think that's ever been more important. And that's a very motivating reason to come into work every day. Amazing. Uh, cult brands like Spotify or even Skittles, Jane had mentioned earlier, when she was up here, often pick fights the way that Skittles picks a fight with predictability. <laughs> does, Sp yeah. does Spotify pick fights? Do you have a villain? Or is there anyone that you're challenging? Um, I, I think if we had a villain, and I don't think we've ever you know, made it an official one or whatever, but I, I think it would be the instinct to tune out. You know, or to or to ever um, to never go outside of your comfort zone. Um, even the way that we approach discovery is always about finding something that's maybe a little uh, a recommendation that might have pushed you a little bit this way, or, or f f you know got you into that genre. Um, you know, when people put in their headphones, you could think about that as almost like blocking out the world, tuning out. We don't. We actually see that as tuning in. We see that as you discovering this, you know, incredible new 19-year-old voice that needs to be heard or listening to a, a, a really important dialogue on a podcast. Um, we think that's a powerful act. You talked about your, your, your higher purpose there. And, you know, besides providing a platform to distribute their music, what are some of the ways that Spotify is nurturing artists or even even nurturing the entire industry. Yeah, well, I, I would also stress that pod, uh, podcasts are, are growing on our platform a lot, and, and so um, helping and enabling podcast creators is also key to us, and we're now um, in the business of even creating Spotify originals with interesting creators that will be um, exclusively on our platform in the podcast space. We don't do exclusivity with music, but we do believe strongly in working with creators um, and supporting them along their career. Um, we have Spotify for musicians, which is, involves programs, tools, ways to think about getting onto playlists, and is both an online resource and also has an experiential arm um, through our creator team. And then we also work in a much more white glove fashion with you know, some of the top artists in the world to see how we can support them at a time when they need to re-engage their fans and get their art out into the world. And that can take the form of huge campaigns. It can take the form of how we playlist and promote them. Um, but we want them to always see us there as a partner, a supporter, and as a fan. Right. Um, well, as competition increases, um, what are you no talking more about? What Google, <laughs> Amazon, Apple? We got nothing to worry about. Those little, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Uh, but there seems like there's more and more streaming services. Yeah. You know, every every time you blink, there's there's something new that's coming out. But what's gonna? You occupy the second spot on the you know, the most relevant brands list. Um, what, what's going to keep Spotify as relevant a brand uh, tomorrow as it, as it is today? Look, if I knew the answer to that, <laughs> I'd be a lot richer than I am. I think we're just going to keep our culture. We're going to keep working really hard and diligently to, to be all the things as a platform that people enjoy about us. Um, we're going to continue to grow um, podcasting and audio. And as a brand, we're going to try to stay true both to our values, to our tone, and to um, our feeling of experimentation. And if a couple of years from now you think that we're failing or ruining and you see me in the street, feel free to give me the honest feedback. I'm, I'm, I can take it. <laughs> right on. Well, there, I know people have lots more questions. So if you want to hear more from Alex or ask him more questions personally, he's going to be doing an, an inner sanctum session tomorrow at 4 o'clock, I yep. believe. If there are any seats left, you can check. It may be sold out. But if not, you should register soon. And uh, thanks very much for... Oh, thank you. It's here. been great. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Great.